Okay, um, welcome everyone. Um, we're very happy to have Bumudian Hamzi uh, talking this week. Um, Bumudian is a uh, Marie Curie Fellow at Imperial. Um, we've worked at many universities um, over the last few years. I looked this up earlier. I think you've worked at UC Davis, um, uh, in Berkeley, at Duke, um, at, in Paris, where I think you also did your uh, PhD. Um, you're also currently an organizer for the ATI Special Interest Group on Machine Learning and Development Systems. Obviously, something that's very relevant to also this, this um, um, seminar series. So we're very happy to have you um, talking this week on machine learning and dynamical systems meet and reproducing kernel hill that spaces. Right. Yeah, thank you for the, for the introduction and thanks you uh, again for the invitation. Thanks all for, uh, for coming. So today I'll be talking about uh, uh, machine learning and uh, dynamical systems and meeting and reproducing kernel hill spaces. And we want to argue that uh, these kind of spaces are a good uh, framework for the interaction between uh, machine learning and uh, dynamical systems. So this is joint work with a lot of people. So I'll uh, be focusing on uh, certain uh, particular results uh, that I'll be talking about uh, in a minute. So the, the general uh, context is, uh, of this research is about uh, how to analyze uh, complex systems. So uh, there are many approaches to, uh, to analyze complex systems and the, we'll focus on uh, the, the two particular ones. The first one is a theory of dynamical systems that allows to analyze complex systems when the model is now. So this uh, approach is, uh, offers non-trivial ways to analyze dynamical systems. It has a, the status of theory, but it is uh, currently limited to uh, low dimensional models and some uh, uh, small classes of infinite dimensional systems as well. Uh, on the other side, you have machine learning, uh, which is constant with algorithms designed to accomplish a certain task uh, whose performance improves with the input of more data. So it's a data-based uh, uh, approach. So it allows, the, it allows the analysis of some very high dimensional complex systems on the basis of data, of, of data when the model is not even now. So the current limitations is that it's mostly a set of techniques and uh, algorithms, so there are no methodologies. So the theory is uh, still underdeveloped and it's not clear why the algorithms work and uh, what, it, uh, what is their domain of applicability. So uh, from this point of view, it makes sense to combine between uh, the theory of dynamical system and machine learning in, our, in order to uh, try to strengthen uh, each other with, uh, yeah, with, uh, with this uh, combination. So one will allow to, uh, to push the limits of the theory of dynamical systems to a high dimensional systems. And then the other one, the direction of machine learning, of dynamical system from machine learning would allow to uh, fully to explain uh, some uh, of the current limitations of machine learning. So as pointed out by Steve Smale uh, about uh, 15 years ago, uh, so he mentioned that the unification of dynamical systems and learning theory is, uh, is a major problem. And then uh, that this unification would hopefully also allow to develop a comparative study of uh, useful algorithms currently available and to give them uh, unity. And uh, yes, it's through his encouragement that both me and uh, Jake Bouvry, when we were both of us at, uh, at Duke, that we got uh, involved in this field. And uh, for example, this is what we wrote uh, in an early paper in 2012, where we said that yeah, mathematical theory uh, necessary to analyze dynamical systems on the basis of observed data is uh, still uh, underdeveloped. And then we, uh, we provided some, uh, some tools in this early paper. So the research context is that we are interested in the, uh, providing a database qualitative theory of dynamical systems for the analysis of uh, prediction of nonlinear systems and control. And uh, so the approach here is to construct a particular kind of Hilbert spaces from data uh, where uh, nonlinear systems will be uh, imbe embedded and where linear system theory will be applied. So here linear system theory is to, to be understood in, in, in a large sense, in the sense that it's mostly uh, we embed into high dimensional space that is constructed from data where a uh, simpler uh, computation can be done. So it can be linear system theory, but it would be uh, uh, any, anything else that will allow to simplify the computation. Uh, the motivation is that uh, working in RKHS allows to find a nonlinear version of algorithms that can be expressed in terms of, of inner products. So here, I mean, instead of, view, viewing, uh, of, uh, yeah, of viewing algorithm only, we will be also looking at, at theories. So we are interested in uh, finding nonlinear versions of theories uh, or theorems uh, based on data. 
so the outline of the talk is for, uh, as follows. So it's, uh, we'll be looking at uh, function, uh, reproducing kind of spaces, what they are, how, how to uh, perform function approximation there. Also, we'll be looking at the probability measures in RKHS and to talk about the maximum mean discrepancy. Then we'll look at uh, kind of laws for, um, which is like a new method that allows to, to, to choose the kernel for learning chaotic dynamical system and see how this can uh, uh, beat uh, some state-of-the-art uh, methods in, uh, in weather prediction. Uh, we'll also be talking about uh, approximation of central manifold in RKHS and uh, uh, prove uh, some version of the central manifold theorem uh, uh, using data. And then we'll talk about construction of Lyapunov functions in RKHS. And uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if I'll have time for, for the other parts, but uh, yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, so let's try to cover some uh, detection of transitions and uh, nonlinear control systems as well as SDEs in, in RKHS. So as I mentioned, I mean, the summary of the approach is as follows, is that we, uh, we have an embedding phi from Rn into H, with H is some RKHS. So we'll be mapping the ambient variable x uh, into some variable z in H. So this transformation is obtained from the kernel that defines the RKHS. So the kernel is a function of two variables. And then so the second variable will be used to, uh, yeah, to build a basis for this uh, RKHS. And as I mentioned before, the data are used to construct this Hilbert space where computations become simpler. Uh, so what are these uh, RKHS? I mean, the, historically speaking, they appeared in the 30s as an answer to the question, when is it possible to embed a metric space into a Hilbert space? So people in the 30s, they had to, to uh, some complex problems, but they did not have uh, computational power at that time. So they were interested in transferring tools from, uh, from linear algebra, for example, in, uh, to, uh, to more complex systems. And the, for example, this was done in uh, quantum mechanics. So there is a flavor of quantum mechanics here in this uh, approach that I'm try, uh, talking about. And the answer is that if the metric satisfies uh, certain conditions, it is possible to, uh, to embed a metric space into a particular kind of Hilbert spaces that are called uh, RKHS. So there have been like properties of RKHS that have been studied in the 50s by Aaron John Schwartz and uh, many others uh, since then. So what are they? I mean, before anything else, they are Hilbert spaces with uh, two extra properties, which are a producing property. Uh, so uh, uh, that uh, RKHS, the Hilbert space with the reproducing kernel, which uh, i.e. a kernel that satisfies the first property. And uh, this reproducing kernel has a span that is dense uh, in H. So this is the second uh, property. Uh, so one, um, some of the properties of the RKHS is unique. It is symmetric, it's positive definite. So it satisfies this uh, interesting property that uh, kxy can be written as an inner product in H of kx dot ky dot. I mean, that's exactly what we were saying, that we wanted to embed a metric space into a Hilbert space. And uh, so we'll be using this canonical feature map, uh, phi cx is equal to kx dot. So there are examples of kernels like the you know, monomial kernel, the Gaussian and the hyperbolic tangent. And uh, yeah, so another way of finding this uh, feature maps is to look at the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues of the integral operator associated to, to the kernel. And from there, one could get the feature map as, uh, as the square root of the lambda j times the cj. So that's what we call uh, Mercer's uh, feature map, uh, which is given by the following uh, equation here. Uh, but in general, as I said, we'll be focusing mostly on Aaron John's uh, feature map, and uh, because here the phi is not unique and it's difficult to compute these eigenfunctions, uh, especially that uh, some non-trivial uh, computations are, are there. So as I mentioned, so it's not necessary to to to, uh, to invoke Mercer's theorem, and one could get uh, like feature maps directly from kernels, for example, for the polynomial kernel. Uh, like of a degree two, one could get the feature map by just extending this inner product and then writing it as a uh, inner product of phi x with pt. So one could get uh, phi x to be uh, to be this uh, uh, yeah. So this in this expression in the case of quadratic kernel, and same thing for the Gaussian. One could get the following uh, feature map directly through uh, direct computations. So RKHS and they play an important role in learning theory, where the the goal is to uh, find an unknown function from random samples. So one is interested in minimizing this uh, functional here. So this functional is not easy to minimize exactly because the, the row is not, uh, is not known. So one would look at an approximation. So it discretizes the, the criterion. 
So we are going to do perform like a regularization in, in the RKHS. And then from there on, what would get easy, uh, easily uh, the solution of this uh, uh, problem to be a uh, sum of Cj kxxj, which is uh, the phi j of x that we are talking about. So you see, we already see here that we have linearity in phi j. And the CJs themselves, I mean, they satisfy a system of linear equations um, that is given by this second equation, uh, that is given by the xj's and the yi's. So, uh, so we, we got the linear, uh, the linear computations in the RKHS. And uh, yeah, so there are these kernel can matrices uh, are, are going to be useful. So, that uh, empirical kernel matrix, as well as the restriction operator and its adjoint, I mean, are going to be useful in, uh, in our work. Uh, RKHS are also used in uh, change point detection. So if one has a, se a sequence of samples x1 to xn, where the, they follow a property distribution p uh, before, before tau, and after tau, uh, they are following another distribution q. So uh, here, the goal is to uh, perform change point detection. So one maps uh, the data set in the RKHS and then computes a measure of discrepancy. So this the measure of discrepancy. This delta, delta n would be small if p is equal to q, and large if p and q are far apart. So here we'll be using the, the MMD, which is uh, essentially uh, uh, the difference between the means in the RKHS, as is defined as follows. But in a more practical way, so it's essentially one will uh, embed the, the probability measure in the RKHS, computes the kernel mean embedding, and then computes the difference between the, the means uh, in, uh, in the RKHS. And uh, so this will be a metric between uh, probability measures that will be useful uh, in our work. And uh, so it's, uh, it's something that can be uh, computed directly from data. And uh, so it's not exactly a metric uh, all, all the times. It's pseudo metric, but it becomes a metric if, uh, if the kernel is uh, characteristic. So that is that the map uh, is, uh, is injective. So, uh, so that's just an example showing how to, to, to perform the computations how to compute the, the difference between the means in the, in the RKHS. And this would be the MMD. I mean, you have probability P and another probability Q. And then you embed it, you compute the means, and then uh, the compute the difference. And this will be the MMD, and it will be maximal when, uh, when you have a discrepancy between the probability measures. And uh, as I said, it's something that can be computed directly from, from data, I mean, as uh, expressed here in the last equation. So it's, uh, it's uh, so in a way, sum of autocorrelation matrices minus uh, cross-correlation matrices, uh, covariance matrices. And uh, the, the nice thing about it is that uh, we have this uh, for characteristic kernel, we have convergence in distribution if and only if we have convergence in, uh, in MM. So now the question is uh, how to, uh, to find the kernel. And that's uh, something that is important for this kind of, uh, of problems. Uh, as I said, so it's, uh, it's important to, to, uh, to find uh, the right RKHS where computations become, uh, become simple. And uh, there's a nice method that was introduced about uh, two years ago by Human Ohadi in, uh, in 2019, where he introduced this method called uh, kernel flows. And um, so it's based on the following uh, observations that given an input output uh, data so we are interested in still learning an unknown function from random samples and in the setting so this is like an ill post problem but in the setting of optimal recovery the problem p can be turned into well posed the problem by restricting by restricting candidates uh, for for this uh, uh, for for this solution of this uh, unknown um, function to belong to a banner space uh, endowed with the following norm and then solving the following uh, optimal recovery problem as the minimizer of this uh, min max problem that is given by, by, this, uh, by this system. Uh, so the premise here is that uh, a kernel is good if there is no significant uh, loss in accuracy in the prediction error if the number of data points is half. Uh, so that's the main, so this is what, uh, what is viewed as a good kernel. And then uh, this led to the introduction of this uh, accuracy, which is a uh, relative error. So the norm of V star minus V S squared divided by the norm of V star squared. So, the, so V star is the, the optimal recovery of U star based on the full data set. And V S is the, the recovery of, uh, of U star based on half of the data set. And then so one computes this, uh, this, uh, this error. 
And uh, so here we have uh, following uh, algorithms. So this relative error can be written explicitly in, as in step three. So the algorithm goes as follows. If one has a family of kernels, k theta x x prime parameterized by theta, for example, in the case of the Gaussian, you have the standard deviation, and then you want to find what is the optimal standard deviation in the, for the, that defines the, the RKHS. So the algorithm goes as follows. So first, so you may have a, a, a full data set. So you, you, you first start by having a, a random sample. Uh, so first you start initializing, so the, the sampling the, from, the, from the, other, the first one. So you get a random sample X, B, Y, B. And then from there, you, you, uh, you get another random sub sub sample of size one half which is xc and uh, and yc and when then one computes this relative error given by uh, one minus uh, yc transpose kt uh, xc with xc is the random sub sub sample and yc are corresponding to the predictions based on on xc and the uh, yf is the yeah, is the, the data set coming from, uh, from, from the random sub, from the, the original sample, the ra random subsample. And uh, yeah, so this will be parameterized by theta. And then one evolves theta in the gradient descent direction of rho. Uh, so we, one will get just theta k plus one is equal to theta k, theta k minus uh, delta gradient of, of rho with respect to theta, and then uh, one repeats. Yeah, so that was uh, yeah, so that was an interesting uh, th thing when I saw that paper. I was uh, very excited to see it, uh, especially that it had a like, kernels and flows. So it sounded like a nice combination of kernel methods and dynamical systems. So yeah, so uh, so uh, yeah, so uh, I started working with Human about this problem of uh, making predictions of uh, dynamical systems that are modeled by the following discrete. Uh, uh, time uh, equations or ODEs in general. So the goal is to forecast uh, Xn plus, plus one based on the observations X1 to uh, Xn. So uh, yeah, F dagger here will be uh, N now. And then uh, even tau dagger will be uh, assumed to be N now. So here I'll focus on the case where we now tau dagger, but uh, if you go to the paper, you will see that we have another, we have a method to find tau dagger from, from data. So here we are going to just uh, consider the, the problem in the setting of uh, regression. So the approximation of the dynamical system can be recast as that of interpolating F dagger from pointwise measurements. So we have F dagger XK is equal to YK. So we have the past XK plus or minus one until XK. And then the, 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 um, the prediction will be XK plus two. And uh, yeah, so uh, as we uh, mentioned before, I mean, this problem has uh, an exact solution given by uh, kxx, uh, kxx minus one uh, y. So here, here we'll add the regularization parameter just to make sure that this matrix is, uh, is invertible. So we'll add plus lambda a. And uh, so that was one uh, variant of kernel flows, which is the original one. But we also uh, introduced uh, other variants because we are, <coughs> in the dynamical uh, system setting. So it makes sense to, to adapt the method uh, for, for, our, uh, for our problems. And uh, so, yeah, so we introduced these two other uh, uh, metrics. So the first one is the, the, the original one, but then uh, in the context of dynamics, I mean, uh, we, we also have uh, introduced this row L where we say that a kernel is good if the estimate of the Lyapunov exponent, uh, here we are focused on the maximal Lyapunov exponent. So if the maximum, if the estimate of the maximal Lyapunov uh, exponent obtained from the kernel approximation of the dynamics does not change if half of the data is used. So we can use, uh, we'll be using this uh, new metric, uh, which is between the estimate of the maximal Lyapunov function, uh, Lyapunov exponent with the capital N points minus uh, the maximal Lyapunov uh, exponent with N over two points. But one could also uh, add other estimates for the other uh, Lyapunov exponents if, if necessary. So we uh, explored that, uh, the, this second metric as well. And uh, we also looked at uh, a third uh, metric that says that uh, this is based on the MMD that I talked about, about before, where we have the raw MMD is the MMD between S1 and S2, where S1 and S2 are uh, two different samples of the time series or uh, between uh, one subsample and another ran random sub subsample from S1. So S2 can be a 
sample, a subsample of S1. So we, uh, yeah, so we started exploring some toy models. <coughs> And uh, yeah, through experiments, uh, we came up with this uh, kernel here. I mean, that seems to be uh, working well for the toy models that we had uh, in mind. So it had, it's a, a kernel that has uh, 11 parameters, so the triangular kernel, the Gaussian, Laplace, uh, locally periodic, and, uh, and quadratic. And the goal is to find these parameters uh, from the data. So alpha zero, sigma zero, alpha one, alpha two, sigma two, uh, alpha three, sigma three, sigma four, sigma five, and uh, alpha four. So we look at the Bernoulli map. I mean, it's like a nice toy model so for chaotic dynamics. So xk plus one is equal to two xk mod one. So we, yeah, we run kernel flows and we see, I mean, that uh, the method works uh, quite well. And uh, so here, so the, the blue is the true dynamics. So without uh, learning the kernel, we see that for, the, for this kind of predictions, the red uh, prediction without learning the kernel is not doing well. But uh, after learning the kernel, which is the, the first figure here, so the, the blue and the red uh, are on top of each other. So in uh, airborne norm, they are not uh, distinguishable. And then uh, same thing for the here, I mean, for the different initial condition. So the blue is true, uh, red is after learning the kernel and green is before learning the kernel. And you see that the method is uh, le learning the kernel here becomes necessary and uh, and it's doing quite well. And uh, yeah, so we also another example for the Lorentz uh, attract or Lorentz system. So it's a 3D system. So we did this exactly. We use uh, the, the same uh, kind of kernels. And we see, I mean, same uh, results are quite, uh, are quite good. So uh, for the X, Y, and Z uh, components. So the predictions are, uh, are quite uh, uh, accurate. Uh, so these are the errors between uh, the, the dynamics before learning the kernel and the, the dynamics between uh, after learning the kernel. So the green is uh, after learning the kernel and, uh, no, sorry, the green is before learning the kernel and the, the red is, uh, is after learning the kernel. So that's, uh, these are the, error, the errors between the true and the approximated dynamics. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, here it's not only about uh, short term predictions, it's also about long term predictions. So we looked also at, uh, at reconstructing the attractor. And uh, so here, this is the projection of the true attractor and its approximation on the x, y, x, z, and y, z uh, planes. So uh, after learning the kernel, it's the, third, uh, the first, third, and, uh, and fifth. And uh, before learning the kernel, it's uh, second, uh, fourth, and uh, and sixth figures. So you see, I mean, that learning the kernel effectively uh, had uh, an impact on not only short-term uh, predictions, but also on asymptotic behavior. And uh, one could see it even uh, for the for the attractors. And here, see, so left side is after learning the kernel, and right side is uh, before learning the kernel. So uh, yeah, so once uh, then when we uh, we uploaded this uh, paper on the archive, I think it was in uh, last July. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, Romit uh, from Argonne National Lab, and he said, okay, I mean, let's try uh, your method on real data set and uh, see what happens. And so he gave us some data set from Argonne National Lab about uh, climate modeling. And uh, yeah, and the method works uh, quite well. So uh, so we uh, so here for the temperature prediction in in Chicago, so uh, we compared between uh, our method kind of flows and two methods that are two PDE methods that are used in Argo National Lab, and then the true uh, data set com coming from satellites. So uh, so high com uh, this method like PDE method that uh, so training or with. Uh, 800 core hours per day of forecast on a Cray XC40 uh, system. And uh, CSM is uh, say 17 million core hours on Yellowstone. And LSTM three hours of, uh, yeah, of all time on 128 computer nodes of uh, this data supercomputer. So they were all taking a lot of time, but our method, it took about 40 seconds to train uh, on a single uh, node machine, like just my personal laptop without acceleration. And you see the method is doing uh, Quite well compared to this uh, to these methods, which are uh, based on supercomputers and PDE method and LSTM. So the blue is uh, our method. Uh, high comments CSM are these methods that are used in Argon, and 
the true is the is the right curve is the is the is the yeah as you see I mean, sometimes you are even uh, you much better than the other ones and so that works only uh, not only for as i said for prediction but also for temperature profiles and the global uh, temperature profiles <laughs> The method of canal flows uh, with uh, for dynamic systems works quite well. Uh, so here, this is the true uh, temperature profile, true, and then canal flows, and the HICOM and CSEM are two PDA, PDA methods, and uh, yeah, and this is doing uh, as uh, as well as other methods. Yeah, I forgot to mention that here the canal is uh, about forty has about forty parameters, and uh, yeah, it didn't take a lot of time to to find them. Uh, yeah, okay. So I said, I mean, yeah, I'd be happy to take questions after the, the end of each part. I mean, are there any questions here? Can I ask a quick question? Yes, yes. So, I mean, like, um, if I understand correctly, it's not that there's a true um, kernel, right? That's sort of like a modeling choice. Um, by choosing the kernel, you're choosing the space you work in. So when yeah. you keep learning the kernel, what you kind of, I guess, mean is, you know, you're learning the regularizer, is how I would kind of think of it, or learning the space. Is yeah, that I'm, correct? So, so we have a prior. So yeah, yeah. So here there's a prior. Yeah. So by choosing the initial kernel, yeah, we are choosing the prior, but then we are trying to, uh, yeah, to to, uh, to find its, uh, I mean, what it is about, right? I mean, the, the parameters that do define the kernel, yeah. Uh, so then, okay, so my question is, like, how do you, so you chose uh, a few slides ago, you showed this very complicated kernel. I mean, how did you come up with that form? Um, yeah, that? so this was, yeah, this was like mostly trial and error, right? I mean, so the, yeah, so I started with the Gaussian kernel, but then I had to think a little bit more about, uh, yeah, the, for example, the, I mean, uh, I mean the, the examples that we, uh, we choose were not random, so we were, we were looking for really for, uh, for Toy models at, that are representative of rich uh, dynamical behavior. So yeah, so uh, yeah, so the key was to really uh, unlock uh, this uh, these problems. And so yeah, so just uh, yeah, trial and error. So the first one was Gaussian, as I said. But then you see for the logistic map, I mean, you know that it's directly related to the tenth map. And when you say tenth map, you are already thinking about this triangular kernel here. And then since we have uh, periodicity then you automatically think about adding a locally periodic kernel that is defined by the following thing. And then you add um, Laplace uh, and uh, quadratic just for, uh, uh, just to make sure that everything is all right. And then it worked well. Yeah, so I, I, so I started adding Gaussian and then added like a little bit, a little like the triangular uh, kernel because the tenth map was, was, was hiding out there. And uh, yeah, then periodicity, I added the other one and then uh, yeah, just add, uh, so it didn't really work. I mean, they, these were like the, the this initial three were okay, but then by adding these two extra terms, the Laplace and the quadratic, things uh, end up working quite well. You know, so it uh -huh. was more, as I said, it was mostly trial and error, and also, but also like thinking a little bit about the dynamics. I mean, the as I said, the the choice of these dynamical models I and mean, the toy models was uh, was not random, so, and the key was to see, try to understand. I mean, to to uh, to transfer the understanding about these dynamics to to kernels and. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, thanks. There's a couple of questions in the chat. I think the first one you answered. The second one is, uh, what's the motivation of introducing Barnock space in the construction of the kernel flow methods? Yeah, I think it's like more of an optimal uh, recovery approach. So just to allow uh, to, to allow it for, for it to to move from an ill post problem to uh, to well post problem. Yeah, so that's what they they worked on with the. Uh, in this optimal recovery setting, yeah. So the, I think that's it's more, uh, yeah, moving from ill, Ill, uh, Ill post to well post, yeah. Okay, a couple more questions have just come in. Um, is there a practical algorithm for learning the smallest set of kernels in the linear combination from a large dictionary of kernels? Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's the tricky part. Yeah, so I think you just have to, to uh, either, uh, yeah, some, uh, some, some them all, and then run kernel flows, and then uh, it will give you uh, hopefully uh, some of, some of the parameters will uh, will tend to zero, and then other ones will will become will be non-zero. Uh, but yeah, but you, you may have also the problem of local minima. So uh, practical advice is just to uh, to do it uh, in an incremental way. I mean, you would start with one, then you add another one, and you add another one, and 
and that's it. But uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, you can have start with uh, some of them, uh, some some all of them, and then run kernel flows, and then see what happens. This is what we did with the practical example with the weather prediction. We just summed this forty kernels. And it's not, it's not yeah, it was forty parameters. So I think it was uh, about twenty kernels or so, um, and then it worked. Yeah, so that's the. Yeah, but there is no practical uh, advice. either do it incrementally and then start with Gaussian and then add to it. Because you, you assume that Gaussian is the universal kernel. So it, it would be like the basis thing. And then if you see periodicity, then you add the other one, the locally periodic here that is in front of alpha three and then, uh, yeah, and then add, yeah. Okay, uh, I'll ask one more question then maybe I'll let you get back to the talk guys we will be here all day. Uh, what is a common choice for n in the kernel flow algorithm? And isn't the kernel matrix quite ill conditioned for large n, which makes it difficult to compute the gradient of the universe? Sorry, the you mean the the kernel the, the capital N? Yeah, the capital N. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so so here the advantage of kernel flows is that uh, as I said, it it uh, where is the you are able to uh, to randomize. So if you have uh, yeah, so if you have uh, you are talking about this choice of capital N. Yeah, so this one, as I said, is, is yeah. So this one is also trial and error. So if you have, for example, you start with one million data set, and uh, yeah, so first you start. With, I mean, you don't. You are not going to run kernel flows on this one million points, but you you do sampling, and then uh, you took a random sample. So you move from one million to maybe one thousand, and then from one thousand, you may move also uh, back in a random sub sub sampling to one hundred. So here the one half, as yeah, so as, yeah. So I forgot to mention this that the one half is not like. Uh, yeah, it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not exact. I mean, it could be even smaller. So uh, in some of the experiments I did, like, uh, like one tenth or this kind of thing, that it could be also a random variable between zero and one. Uh, yeah, but I th yeah, this is also trial and error. But the nice thing about it is that you can reduce, uh, reduce it a lot. And at each iteration, you would choose uh, like a different uh, subsample, different, uh, yeah, different subsample uh, with, uh, with the same size. So you can do one, Thousand, for example, if you start with one million, and you move to one thousand. The next iteration it will be another one thousand, and then the other iteration it will be another one thousand. So it doesn't have to be fixed from the beginning, right? So it's good. You, you could change it in every iteration. Okay, thank you very much. This, there are other questions coming in, but I think in just the time I'll sort of let you carry on. Um, but we can come back to this at the end of the talk. I think. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. yeah all right. Yeah, so the second part is about uh, center manifold uh, approximation. So, the, so here we are interested in, uh, in some sense, like pre preserving uh, stability properties uh, for complex dynamical systems uh, through uh, model reduction and uh, using uh, canon methods. So here we look at the center manifold analysis and we want to, 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 uh, to prove that uh, that it is possible to do that for this kind of, uh, of, of system with uh, non-hyperbolic uh, equilibrium point. So uh, as we know, I mean, if you have a differential equation x dot is equal to f of x, so um, assume that we have uh, the origin is an equilibrium point. So if all the eigenvalues of the linearization f has a negative real parts, then the origin is asymptotically stable. If some of them have a positive real parts, then the origin is unstable. But if some of them are on the imaginary axis, and the other ones are on the left open half plane, then the linearization test fails uh, to determine the stability properties of the origin. And uh, so after a linear change of the linear part, I mean, the, the matrix, I mean, we could decompose it into uh, F1 and F2 with the eigenvalues of F1 are on the imaginary axis and the eigenvalues of F2 are on the, would have uh, on the open left half plane. So intuitively we expect that the stability of the equilibrium of the full order system to depend only on the stability properties of the reduced order system uh, corresponding to uh, to the x1 component because the x2 components will tend to uh, to zero since the eigenvalues of f2 are uh, strictly negative and that's exactly what the center manifold theorem is about so it's telling us that uh, there exists an invariant manifold x2 is equal to theta x1 tangent to the x1 directions at the origin and uh, given the the composition that we brought initially i mean uh, and uh, Given that x is equal to theta x one, we did use that uh, theta satisfies the following uh, PDE. So just like plug in x two uh, in the second equation, for example, and then I replace uh, x one dot by its uh, by the first one, and you would get the following uh, PDE. 
And the central manifold theorem ensures that there are smooth uh, solutions to this, uh, to, to this PDE. Uh, and it also says that the center dynamic, dynamics where you are replacing S2 by theta X, X1 will have uh, the same stability properties as the full order system. So, the, so it says that the equilibria X1 uh, is equal to zero and X2 is equal to zero of the original uh, dynamics is locally asymptotically stable if and only if the equilibria uh, X1 is equal to zero of the reduced uh, order system, which is the center dynamics, is locally asymptotically stable. And it also for instability, so we can also think about uh, unstable equilibria as well. So uh, after solving the PDE, I mean, this uh, problem of uh, stability uh, reduces to uh, analyzing the nonlinear stability of the lower dimensional uh, system. So we wouldn't have to, to look at the full order system. You just have to look at the reduced order system and it will have the same stability properties. So our contribution is to look at uh, yeah, canon method to approximate the center manifold and uh, propose a database version of the center manifold theorem. So we assume that we don't know uh, the right-hand side uh, of the ODE. We have only samples, and we want to construct uh, a center manifold that preserves the stability properties of, of the full order system. And so, the, yeah, so, uh, so here, I mean, we, uh, we looked at some, uh, yeah, so yeah, just different. So we have some uh, rigorous results. I mean, you can look at the preprints. So I'm just going to go quickly about what we had. So the, we assume that theta hat be uh, the approximate of the center manifold. So we are look, essentially looking for a kernel approximation of the solution of the PDE. But given that this solution has two constraints, I mean, that theta of zero is equal to zero and its derivative is zero. So we'll be looking at the generalized version of the presented theorem and uh, we'll have the first one is the reproducing property, but we also need uh, the reproducing uh, property of the derivative. So we have to look at uh, a more general class of RKHS that not only does uh, the reproducing property is not only for the function, but it's also for its derivative. So we get, we'll be using this uh, uh, interponent and we prove that under certain conditions that if the equilibrium of, uh, of the reduced to reduce or the system where theta hat is an approximate, uh, that is given by this following equation here, given the, the samples, uh, so if this one is asymptotically stable, uh, then the equilibrium of the full order system is asymptotically stable. So in a way we have, uh, we got a uh, stability or asymptotic stability preserving uh, property. Uh, so in one direction at least, so the, we are still working on the second direction, which is that if you have a full order system that is stable, how do, do, you, do you prove that you, are, you can preserve the stability properties for, uh, for the second direction? And we also proved that, uh, yeah, the, there is a bound between the trajectories of the x1 t theta t minus x1 uh, theta hat t. So that this is the true center manifold and this is the approximation. We also proved that it is uh, bounded. So uh, that's an example here. Uh, so this two dimensional system, x dot is equal to x, y and y dot is equal to minus y minus x square. So analytically the center manifold is uh, y is equal to minus x square. So uh, what, I mean the way, you, uh, you usually do it, you just uh, solve uh, the PDE term by term. So you just uh, get the Taylor series expansion of the right-hand side and then plug it into the PDE and then solve it term by term. So what we did is we just uh, used the software. It is available online. I think it's Roberts from uh, Australia. I forgot the name of the university in Australia, but uh, it's, it's nice uh, software. And uh, so here we looked at, uh, yeah, we used two kernels, quartic kernel and uh, the Gaussian kernel. Uh, to get uh, the, the center manifold. And the, you see the approximation error for K1 and K2 is, uh, is quite small. Uh, so we also looked at uh, uh, yeah, high dimensional center manifolds. I mean, here the center manifold is of dimension two. Uh, so because the, yeah, the number of uh, eigenvalues that are on the imaginary axis is equal to two. And same, I mean, the, the method works uh, quite well. I mean, here you see for a quartic kernel and a Gaussian kernel, these are the reconstruction of the center manifold. And uh, these are the errors in the, in the second row. Uh, yeah, so uh, then, yeah, then last part, I think I'm just going to finish after the Lyapunov functions. So yeah, so then, yes, yeah, so then the last part uh, is to look also to uh, same like similar kind of problems where we have uh, data com coming from non ODE and we also want to, uh, to approximate objects that are useful in uh, qualitative theory. So here we're, First, uh, second part, we looked at the approximation of center manifolds. And then here we'll be looking at uh, approximation of uh, Lyapunov functions. 
And the Apollo functions, as we know, are useful to reconstruct the, um, the basin of attraction. So uh, what we do is, uh, in, in a way, like similar line of thoughts. I mean, we assume that we don't know the right-hand side. Uh, we have only the samples. So here, the, the approach is, uh, is less direct. I mean, in the center manifold, the approach, we, the approach was more direct because we do not have to approximate F. We just attack directly the PD, di the PD directly uh, um, that the center manifold satisfies. So here we approximate f from x t i. I mean, we found the Lyapunov function v hat for uh, for the approximation, and then we prove that v hat is also Lyapunov function for uh, for f. Yeah. So here, uh, so uh, yeah. So what we uh, we are interested in is uh, this kind of problem. So we have a nonlinear ODE with initial condition condition c. So we assume that the the origin is an equilibrium point, uh, and then the the basin of attraction is a set of initial of conditions. The set of initial conditions that that uh, the, the asymptotic solution tends to, to the origin. And uh, the basin of attraction can be uh, determined using uh, Lyapunov functions. It's essentially the, the, the level sets, uh, some uh, level sets of the Lyapunov uh, function. So Lyapunov function is, uh, yeah, is a positive definite uh, function such that its uh, orbital derivative is, uh, is negative. And uh, yeah, so this is how we define, as I said, this is how we could define the the basin of attraction. So it's, uh, yeah, so the, the sub-level sets are, uh, are in the basin of attraction. Uh, yeah, so the way, I mean, the, you have like this, uh, uh, this uh, results of existence that allows you to co construct in a way this Lyapunov function by looking not only at the differential inequality, but you could also set the right-hand side to, uh, to some negative function. So we have here a set of the, the orbital derivative is equal to minus norm of x squared. So this uh, function, the Lyapunov function, is, is uniquely defined uh, up to a constant. And then, uh, yeah, then I mean, there is uh, Peter Giesel who uh, generalized this approach by looking at uh, like more general cases, more, more general right-hand sides, p, uh, uh, so minus p with p is positive, and uh, we'll see how, what are the conditions that p satisfies. And then he looked at solving this kind of PDEs using radial basis functions when the right-hand side is known. So our contribution was to generalize the Peter Giesel's approach to the case where the right-hand side is not known. Uh, so he, uh, yeah, so given all these conditions on P, so A, B, and, uh, and C, so one could solve uh, this uh, PDE for the Lyapunov function using radial basis functions. And then he got also, uh, so that's the, the on that, so that would be used. I mean, it's, uh, so you see it also has uh, derivatives in it, so here the, so it's a sort of generalized uh, interpolation problem where you don't have constants anymore, but you also have a differential uh, operator in front of the phi. So here is differentiation with respect to the second argument y, and then evaluation at, uh, and then evaluation followed by evaluation at x k. Uh, yeah. So the then one would get also uh, uh, yeah linear system of equations uh, for the, for the coefficients that is given by the following set of equations. And uh, yeah, and then we will get uh, one would get the, the Lyapunov function given by this uh, on that that I mentioned here. So the beta case, beta case satisfies system of linear equations, and um, one will get this B one. So uh, and then we also could prove that uh, yeah, the difference between the orbital derivatives between the true uh, Lyapunov function and its approximation is also bounded, and we uh, also proved the, the same thing for. Uh, when we don't know the f, so that's uh, so we had uh, we just extended this uh, framework to the case uh, where the right hand side is not known, but uh, instead we have samples. Uh, yeah, so I said we have assumed that we don't know the right hand side. We have samples x i y i, and uh, we look for suitable functions in an RKHS, and uh, we also derived error estimates uh, for the Lyapunov functions and their uh, orbital derivatives. So look, looking at for example, this uh, 2D example, uh, where we know what the Lyapunov function is, it's just a quadratic function. So we, uh, yeah, so we, we did apply the same method. So we have samples, we approximate the right-hand side from the samples, and then we, we solve the, um, we use the on that uh, for, the, for the approximation, and then we get an approximation of the Lyapunov function. And uh, one could see that here yeah, by, yeah, so the, by increasing the number of points, the, 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 the the Lyapunov function uh, has an orbital derivative that gets uh, negative, more and more negative. And uh, that's what we see here for 360 points. That this is how the orbital derivative looks like. And then 
This is when the increased number of points to 1520. Uh, so, what is, yeah, so maybe I'll just talk a little bit about this. So then the second, I mean, then the last part, I mean, I think I'll be talking about it, this will be the last part. Uh, so here also there is one uh, aspect of uh, detecting critical transitions for uh, multi-scale uh, SDEs. So we looked at uh, some uh, fast low uh, SDEs. Uh, so with X1 and X components with uh, where we have some critical transitions. Uh, we also show by looking at the MMD, so maximum mean discrepancy as a metric. So once we, uh, when we apply it to this kind of SDE with critical transition, we show that the MMD uh, is, make, uh, is maximal at the critical point. And uh, here I'm just going to show a simple example with stochastic uh, uh, van der Poel, which has a periodic, uh, periodic reset. And uh, yeah, so here we see that also the MMD uh, in that case is maximum. So this is this is how the time series looks like. So there is a, there are some critical transitions at this point, and then we show that the MMD is effectively max maximal. So the way we did is that we have a sliding window on the time series, and then uh, and then it's uh, so the first part is used as the the, the 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 x's, and then the second part is the y's. And then we compare, uh, compute the MMD between the first, first part of the interval and the second part of the interval. And uh, yeah, so once there, when, when there is a jump, uh, so the MMD is maximal. So here, for example, if you are in this part, I mean, you can compare between the first part of the interval uh, before the critical transition, and then the second part of the interval after the critical transition. And uh, we show that the, the MMD is effectively maximal. So that's the second uh, part here. So uh, yeah, so it's already 48. So uh, yeah, I think I'll just probably stop here because I have a lot of slides, but I don't think I'll have time to talk about them. So uh, I'll just conclude. Yeah, so uh, conclusions. So we use the, uh, oops. Yeah, kind of flows to approximate a chaotic dynamical system. Then we showed uh, that this uh, method works quite well, not only for toy models, but also it beats uh, state-of-the-art methods for climate, uh, Predictions. Uh, we also used uh, the maximum discrepancy as a metric to detect uh, critical transitions. And um, yes, yeah, so then we also talked about database approach for the construction of Yapunov functions. And then we talked about sentence manifold uh, approximation. And we also talked about uh, database version of the sentence manifold theorem. And so these results, I mean, collectively argue that working in RKHS offers uh, tools uh, for a database theory of. Uh, only in a dynamical system. So remember here, the goal was to uh, yeah, bridge the gap uh, between uh, model-based uh, dynamical systems and uh, data-based uh, approaches. And uh, the, the whole uh, story here is that we wanted to argue for reproducing canary spaces as, uh, as the right kind of spaces where you can uh, develop rigorous results uh, for, uh, from dynamical system theory point of view, but based on, on data where you could get a uh, bit of both words. And uh, yeah, these are like some references. Uh, yeah, starting from the, our original paper in 2010 to uh, latest one in uh, 2021 about uh, geophys geophysical uh, forecasting. Yeah, all right, thank you. If you have questions, yeah.